Good morning. Well, I'm here to provoke you, uh, so I'll get right to it. When it comes to democracy, uh, we've all been living a lie. And in the next few minutes, I want to convince you of just two things. The first is about the big lie of democracy and what it means. And the second is why collective intelligence must be democracy's future. First, the big lie. 1776, 1789, the Declaration of Independence, the US Constitution. Founding documents of democracy, we're told. These documents, which inspired so many others like them around the world, limit government power and establish the people as sovereign. You've read them, or maybe you've claimed on TV that you've read them. Now, the next time you read them, I want you to do me a favor and count the number of times the word democracy appears. I'll give you a hint. The answer is zero. Zero times. And I submit to you this was not a mistake. The founding fathers knew what they were doing. They weren't trying to design a democracy. They were trying to establish a republic. Well, what's the difference? Well, founding father Benjamin Rush uh, in 1787 explained it this way. All power is derived from the people, but they only possess it on the day of their elections. After this, it's the property of their rulers, nor can they exercise or resume it unless it is abused. In this American and now global system, citizens were not meant to rule, but to choose among their betters, replacing hereditary monarchy with what Thomas Jefferson called a natural aristocracy. Government of the people, for the people, by a very small, disproportionately wealthy, Ivy League educated, mostly male sliver of the people. Now, I admit not quite as good as Lincoln's version, but this is the republic our founding fathers designed and the template for those of over 120 countries today. But because the right to vote was such a step forward uh, compared to the powers of French peasants or Russian serfs, expanding that one single power, first to poorer men, then to women and African Americans, uh, felt to many like the flowering of democracy. But it wasn't. If you think that democratic power is limited to who votes in elections, then you too have fallen for the big lie. We do not live in democracies. We live in republics with slight democratic flavoring. Now, I want to expand your view of what citizen power looks like. Now, imagine all of us in this room are a community trying to solve a complex problem, let's say water scarcity. What would we do? Well, first, we would observe together. Each of us, farmers, scientists, maintenance workers, gathers information on how conditions are changing, where the problems are, and we would pool these observations together. Second, we would interpret, build models, make predictions, because each of us has a slightly different cognitive profile, some more daring, some more skeptical. The aggregate of our predictions are more likely to be accurate than those of a single small group of experts who share the same blind spots. Third, we would come together to generate new ideas. The biggest tech breakthroughs in history, from the steam engine to the internet, weren't the products of sole genius, but of networks of tinkerers who could compete with one another and build on each other's work. Fourth, we would deliberate and decide what our water strategy would be. We wouldn't just call a vote. We would put all the options on the table, challenge each other's ideas, talk about the trade-offs. Practice is very common in indigenous communities, incidentally, but almost entirely absent from what we think of as democracy today. Then, because we'd contributed to this solution, we would be incentivized to act and help implement our collective strategy. And finally, we would pool together what we'd learned. Uh, our collective wisdom, and uh, do our best to conserve it and pass it on. These are what we call the six functional capacities of collective intelligence, what my colleagues at the school and I are working each day to study and reinforce. And it is this wider range of capacities, not just voting, that defined the scope of citizen power in ancient Athens. You see, before democracy came to Athens in the 6th century BCE, Athens was a respectable middle-tier town. But in 508 BC, the citizens expelled a tyrant and gave their support to Cleisthenes and his democratic design. 
Over the next 150 years, Athens shot to the top of the Greek world. They defeated the Persian Empire. They established trading routes from Odessa to Gibraltar, medicine, philosophy, the Parthenon. The collective intelligence of Athenians, the people of this city, made it possible. And in their assembly, they didn't just vote. They pooled together news from all over the Mediterranean. They debated, and they learned how to sort good information from bad. Democracy wasn't just voting once a year. It was a constant process of learning, of generating new knowledge. And almost every citizen would serve at least once on the Council of 500, the executive branch of the city chosen by lottery each year. Rich or poor, you would get hands-on governing experience, solving problems, working with people different from you, a boot camp in democracy. And in your year of service, your living costs would be covered by the state. Now, of course, citizenship in Athens didn't include everyone, notably women, immigrants, and slaves. 2,500 years later, we can and should do better than them. But the fact remains that those 40,000 or so citizens who governed ancient Athens had more power in their hands than any citizen body before or since. This was democracy. And despite the threats and the doubters, for over a century and a half, it flourished. Okay, now back to us. Why not just bring in a PhD in environmental science to tell the farmers what to do? Because as any Athenian would tell you, Individual experts are best when problems are well-defined, and most big public problems, from climate change to migration to economic inequality, are highly complex and in constant motion. These are the kind of problems that defeat experts and algorithms working alone, the kind of problems where a very large number of eyes and ears, of ideas and experiences can produce better solutions. Now, I'm not a populist. I'm not against expertise. But if we are going to enter an age of collective intelligence, we need to expand our idea of what counts as expertise and invite it in from new places. Democracy is in crisis because it is not yet democracy. Republics from ancient Rome to right now were designed to produce ruling elites. And as we've learned, ruling elites tend to produce decisions that help people like them. What we need to do in this century, if we rise to the occasion, we can keep the depth we have fought for in the Republican model. The rule of law, the freedom of conscience, the universal right to vote regardless of gender or color, and expand it to include all of the things an Athenian citizen could do. What we need to do in this century is reinvent our institutions to make collective intelligence and thus democracy finally possible. At our school, working with partners at MIT, Yale, and the Ecole Normale Supérieure, we are developing solutions on the African continent that can reshape how the whole world thinks about democracy. One of the first findings that you might find interesting, it turns out that the collective intelligence of a group is directly proportional to the number of women within it. More women, better decisions. Did we know that already? Well, we knew that already, but now we have science to back it up. But of course, in this century, good science won't always be enough. Politics is hard. I've lost as many political campaigns as I've won, and I know that power does not give up without a fight. But in this century, climate change is forcing our hands. If humanity wants to survive what's coming, we will have to move from fragile hierarchies to resilient networks, from closed to open data, from guarded to distributed forms of power. As this climate collapse accelerates, those societies that aim to control and harvest data from their citizens are simply not going to produce good enough algorithms to keep up with the problem. It will be the societies that bet on collective intelligence, on the active engagement and pooled expertise of citizens that are going to win this century. And it's already starting. In places like Lebanon and Malaysia, on the front lines of climate change, CI-driven water and waste management strategies are already being scaled. And in places like Ireland and France, elected leaders are putting real power into citizen assemblies. And why? Because they know that they need to shake up the 18th century model, because if they don't, the populists will. 
This is where you come in. With all due respect to the Prime Minister, the transition to collective intelligence is unlikely to come from a treaty between heads of state. Rather, it will come from a growing network of success, of collective intelligence initiatives in government, but also in companies and communities, working together in networks to solve complex problems from the bottom up. And finally, those of you who think that everyday people are just too lazy or misinformed, watch what happens when you put real citizen, bona fide citizen power in their hands. I've been on the ground in India, in Senegal, in Czech Republic, and in the Bronx, and the lesson is always the same. When people put down their phones and start reasoning, big things happen. In this next age, the age of collective intelligence. We will not only make democracy more fair and more just, we will outcompete the autocrats and their algorithms. We will build together democracy that ancient Athenians could only have dreamed of, democracy that we deserve now. This is our call to arms at the School of Collective Intelligence, and we invite you to join this cause. Thank you very much.